If you will, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, verse 46. Daniel 2, verse 46. If you're using a Bible in front of you from the pew, um, it is page 615. And if you don't have a Bible of your own, um, consider this a gift to you from us. Um, We care more about you having a Bible than we do it being in our pew. So take it as a gift if you need one. So we're in this series, Thriving in Babylon, and we're looking at how you live in a culture that is at odds with your faith. How do we live in a culture that's at odds with our faith? Daniel's suffering prepared him for Babylon, but it was his hope, his humility, and his wisdom that enabled him to thrive in Babylon. To, to not just go there and exist, but to literally thrive and to become one of the highest ruling officials in the land. Last week we looked at hope and the hope that Daniel had and, and how out of that hope came everything really that enabled him to, to thrive as a Hebrew in a foreign land. So this week we look at humility Solomon is considered to be one of the wisest men to have ever lived, even in our day today, one of the wisest men to ever live. He was actually the son of King David, and and if he's the wisest man to ever live, and these are some of his insights and words of wisdom to us. Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 15:33 Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. Proverbs 18:12 Before a downfall the heart is haughty but humility comes before honor. Proverbs 22:4 Humility is the fear of the Lord its wages are riches and honor and life. So humility is kind of an important thing, according to the wisest man to ever live. Courage without humility, one author writes, leads to martyrdom. Humility without courage leads to spinelessness. So we've got to have a middle ground there somewhere. Humility today does not tend to be one of the top choices of characteristics that they want parents want their children to have. Uh, because we see humility as, as something as being weak. So we want our kids to be strong and, and defend what they believe in and stand up for their thoughts, whether they're right or wrong. Humility tends to be viewed as a lack of ambition or, or low self-esteem or an effort to to downplay or minimize our accomplishments. But these are not the marks of biblical humility or spiritual maturity. They're actually the marks of insecurity. So real quickly, let's go through what humility is not. The first thing is humility is not low self-esteem. Romans 12.3 Paul writes, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. With sober judgment. Think about this. Jesus was humble, but he also had a really high opinion of himself. I mean, he literally claimed to be God. But yet he was humble, It wasn't a low self-esteem issue. It was literally him being who he was. Or think about what we talked about a few weeks ago, how Daniel described himself and his three other friends that became servants to the king. He's described them as young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He had a high opinion of himself. But he was still a humble person. 
Number two, it's not a lack of ambition. Daniel 1, 19 and 20 tells us that Daniel and his friends actually graduated at the top of their class and were considered the wisest people among all of the smart guys in the land. Okay, how, how can you be someone who worships God and, and puts God first in your life, but then graduate at the top of your class when it comes to studying the dark arts of the occult and all of these satanic things that they had to learn, but they finished at the top of their class. No one did better than them. So it's not of a lack of ambition. It's not downplaying our accomplishments. Biblical humility does not mean we can never tell people about the successes or accomplishments that we have or refuse to take joy and pride in, in them. Biblical humility is about those successes and accomplishments being overlooked and it being completely okay with you. How many of you that comes easy for if one of your accomplishments that you worked really hard for gets no credit, gets no like visibility in front of your peers? How many of you take that really well? Uh, My hand's up for show and tell, not because it's true. No, it's tough. I mean, we worked hard for that. But humility is it being okay if they're overlooked. So what is humility? It's this. It's serving others. It's serving others. At the core of biblical humility is to serve others by putting their needs and interests above our own. I like the way that one author puts it. It's treating others the same way we would treat them if they were someone important. You know, how do we treat, you know, people that we view as important versus a homeless person versus the president of the United States? You know, do we treat those two the same? Regardless of how you feel about the president, do we treat those the same? I'm not saying that we become a doormat and let people walk all over us. I mean, that's... It's not about having people take advantage of us or walk all over us. However, it does mean that we become a servant. And not just a servant to those who deserve it, but also a servant to the people who don't deserve it. When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, when they were in the upper room preparing to literally have the, the last supper of, of, that Jesus would have, Jesus washed their feet, but he also washed the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. Judas did not deserve what Jesus did to him, but Jesus served him despite what he deserved. When Jesus is telling the parable of the the Good Samaritan, and he tells us that we're to love our neighbors and Who are our neighbors? Well, our neighbors are a friend, foe, anyone who literally crosses our path. They are our neighbor, and we're to love them and to care for them. So looking at Daniel and his humility. One night, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He didn't understand what the dream meant, so the next day, he called in all of his magicians, I about said musicians again, enchanters, the sorcerers, he calls all of those in and he says, interpret my dream for me that I had last night. I need to understand what it said. But he didn't tell them what the dream was. And without telling them what the dream was, if they couldn't interpret the dream for him, then he was going to kill them. Those are your two options. Interpret my dream for me or you're dead. 
Luckily, God spoke through Daniel. And Daniel went to the king and he told him what the dream meant. And he interpreted the dream, but not only did he interpret the dream, but he also saved the lives of the people that King Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill. So in your Bibles, look with me at Daniel 2. We pick up at the very end. Daniel has just interpreted the dream. He has not only interpreted the dream, he literally told King Nebuchadnezzar, this is what the dream was, this is what the dream means. This is the response that King Nebuchadnezzar has. Verse 46 of chapter 2. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. That's, that's great and wonderful. But the next part, I don't miss this next part because it's important too. The king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as administrators over the providence, province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now, wait a second. I'm confused. I, I thought Daniel was an Israelite, a Hebrew from Jerusalem who worshipped Yahweh, God, and now he's in this godless culture. And not only is he in this godless culture, he becomes first in his class. There's no one wiser than Daniel among all of the wise men. Now you see, we would do the opposite, I think. Because it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's what we actually do now, today. We do the opposite. If someone's in charge of us that we don't like, if they're doing things that we don't want them to do, if they're doing things that we don't think are right, what do we do? We get out. We run. We don't want any part of it. But in humility, Daniel served King Nebuchadnezzar. Look what happened. He literally changed the mind of the king who was hated God. What a nothing to do with God. He served wicked kings well with loyalty. And it kept getting him promoted. And promoted and he keeps getting higher and higher in the ladder of status. But every time he's promoted, his influence grows greater and greater, eventually leading King Nebuchadnezzar and King Darius to proclaim Daniel's God as the only one true God. Is that the way we do things today? To serve people with loyalty? If we want to significantly influence our modern day Babylon, we'll have to change our tactics. Instead of avoiding or attacking the godless leaders of our day, we'll need to begin to engage. And engage them in the same way that Daniel did, humbly serving them, whomever God chooses to temporarily place in the positions of authority. Why? Because it's the only way we'll ever be heard. It's the only way we'll ever be heard. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, Paul had to deal with the problem exactly like this. 
He had to write to the Corinthians again uh, because they had misunderstood his instructions in a previous letter. He had told them not to associate with those who were sexually immoral, greedy, dishonest in their business dealings, or worshiping false gods. He said, don't have any interaction with those people. But the thing is, they thought that Paul was saying to avoid non-Christians. If people are, are not Christians, to avoid them. But Paul was actually saying the opposite. He did not tell them to cut off the non-Christians, because he says to, to do that, to be able to do that, you would have to leave this world. It's impossible. But no, he's saying, no, the people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but still live like hell, have nothing to do with those people. Cut those people off. Because why? What do they do? They do what we're really good at as Christians. They give who a bad name? Jesus. Biblical humility offers respect to everyone. Biblical humility begins when we recognize that everyone bears the image of God, despite how marred that image may be. about that everyone bears the image of God despite what that person has done to that image themselves Daniel genuinely desired the best for his captors Consider the way he addresses King Nebuchadnezzar when he learns of the interpretation. Another time that Daniel interprets um, one of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams in, in chapter 4, this is how Daniel responds. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and he, his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Listen to this. Belshazzar answered, my Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. You see, Daniel realized that this dream was talking about what would happen to King Nebuchadnezzar and it wasn't good that he was going to go out into the woods and he was going to live there by himself and he was going to eat off of the land and he was going to live separated from everyone else until he gave in and said and professed that God was the one true God and no others. But Daniel knew what that meant for Nebuchadnezzar. And he wanted the best for him and so he didn't want to tell him. As you read through the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they address, every time they are talking to Nebuchadnezzar, they address him with respect. They, they either refer to him as your majesty or my Lord. Lowercase l, not capital L, because capital L would be Lord God, but lowercase l. They always addressed him with respect. Daniel's respect came from the belief and the understanding that God was in control of who's in control. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar was in control because God put him there. God gave him the ability to be in control. Daniel was not, re not respectful because Nebuchadnezzar deserved it. He was respectful because God commanded it. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. 
Or Paul says in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Jeremiah 27, 9 through 11 says the same thing that those two just did. That we're we're supposed to submit to the authorities that are over us. Regardless of what they believe regardless of who they believe in I have a question for you you know there's all throughout Obama's presidency when he ran for president there was always this question that people always wanted to throw out there was oh Obama's Muslim here's my question Why did it matter? Why did it matter to us? Because what we were saying was, we won't respect you or honor you if you're not this. But God says it doesn't matter that we're to serve those people regardless of what they believe. The fact is, if we're unwilling to treat godless leaders with respect, we'll have no chance of influencing their decisions and actions. No one listens to people who look down on them with contempt or disdain. When we know that others don't like or respect us, we shut them out become defensive, and go on the attack. This is exactly what culture has done to Christians at large. You see, there's a problem. There's, there's a, a model out there. It's uh, the spiritual warfare. Uh, anyone ever heard someone talk about spiritual warfare? Okay, a few of you. It's this idea that there's this battle going on. There's this good side, God's side, and there's this bad side, Satan's side, and there's only two sides. In every situation, there's a battle, and it has to be a battle. It's a fight between good and evil, and good always has to come through and be victorious. But you see, the problem with the spiritual warfare model is that every time we encounter a non-Christian, They're an adversary. Every time we encounter someone who does not believe what we believe, there's now this confrontation that has to take place. It's now, I know what is right, you don't know what you think you know, and I know better than you. And it comes out in how we talk to each other. It comes out in how we hang out with these people, whether we want them to be in our group or not. If you don't think it's true, just think about when you became a Christian for the first time, how many non-Christian friends did you have? More than likely, a big group of them, right? How many years later was that group the same? Oh, it begins to change. Before long, I think it's like within 10 years of giving your life to Christ, it, it says that you have like one, if any, friends that are, are non-Christians. Because you've totally left them and said, they don't, they, I, need to cha- I need to get rid of those friends because these should be my friends now. But what God is saying, no, the opposite. You need to stay in that group. You need to influence them. You need to love them like you loved them before you knew who I was. But this time, you're going to love them because I love you. And you know that I love you. See, we have to realize who our enemy really is. We have to realize who our enemy really is. Because you see, a spiritual warfare model focuses on the wrong enemy. The spiritual warfare model looks at non-Christians as being the enemy. But you see, they're not the enemy. They're victims. They're the victims of the enemy.
They're victims that need rescued. You see, there's danger in saying that line right there. That they need rescued. Because as human beings, what do we like to do? We want to jump in and we want to rescue them. But we do it with this forceful way of doing things of... This is what you need to do. There's no other option. And we continually just to push and press. And I mean, we have it in our mind that before we leave this discussion with this non-Christian, they have to be a Christian or we've failed. But that's not the case at all. You see, God gave us one command, and that was to be the messenger. When you deliver the message... You've done your job. You can't do anything else. Because if you try to do anything else, all you're going to do is hurt the situation. Our job is to point to the transformer. It's God's job to do the transforming. He's the one who can do the transforming in people's lives. We can't. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And I know what some of you are thinking. So I went ahead already and did a little research and and I looked up in the Greek just to verify for everyone um, where Paul says, be kind to everyone. Just in case you're wondering, the translation from the Greek, Greek, everyone, literally means everyone. Not, not the people, we don't get to pick and choose. Like literally everyone we're to be kind to. And d- don't miss that. Be able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be forcefully, no, must be gently instructed. Gently instructed. You see, when we get forceful, all we do is push them away. There are going to be people in your life that you will literally have to love and be gracious to for your whole life before something clicks in their mind and in their heart and they realize that the whole time you were just loving them. That you didn't pressure them into anything. You just loved them anyway. I've had permission to share this story, so I'll share it. There's a guy in recovery group. He, he's had a rough life. He's lost multiple very expensive homes, um, been bankrupt quite a few times because of drugs. And he said it finally came to a point where he had to go to prison. He went to prison and he said, you know, I had this thought in my head of what Christians were, what they were like. He goes, you know, one day I'm sitting there in the yard and I'm just sitting there. He goes, I hadn't made any friends yet, hadn't talked to anyone, just sitting there. And he said, I catch a glimpse of this guy coming across the yard. He said, it was the biggest guy there in the prison. He said he was huge. He said tattoos everywhere. 
and he had guys with him that were just as big. He was like, I'm done. He's like, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get beat into submission. He said, the guy walks up to him. He says, no joke. Puts his hand on my shoulder. Says, hey, I see you're new here. Is it okay if I pray with you? He said, totally just floored him. He's like, I didn't have word. I didn't even know what to say. He's like, I couldn't even respond to say yes or no. It was like, how do I? And so the guy prays with him. And this guy becomes his friend. And it was never a, you have to do this. You have to follow Jesus. This is the only way you're going to survive. This is the only, it was never any of that. All he simply did was just walk up and say, can I pray for you? Loving people with humility. But here's the thing that we have to understand we will not change the world by getting the right person in the office of president. We will not change the, the community by having the right mayor. Even if it's a Christian mayor, will not change everything because that's just one person. It begins when every single one of us commit to influencing the people in our lives. It will happen when we make the choice to say, you know what, I, I don't like my boss. I don't like the fact that they're over me because quite frankly, they stink at their job. And I can think of two people in here right now that are thinking that very same thing. But what if we said, I don't like it but that's not my job. I wasn't hired to critique them. I wasn't hired to do their job. I wasn't hired to, I was hired to do my job and so I'm gonna serve them. I'm gonna love them despite who they are. Is it easy? Not in the slightest. It's a whole lot of prayer. It's a whole lot of God, give me the strength. But it can be done. And it's literally how we change the world. Not by forcing people's hand, but by influencing them. Because we've gained their respect. You see, the thing is, every single Christian should be able to sit down with a non-Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist and have a civil conversation without trying to kill each other with your words because you think one is right and one is wrong. That's not how we change the world. That's not how we influence the world for Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that we're celebrating communion today. Because literally, communion is a model for exactly what we're talking about. We celebrate communion because Jesus, first off, because Jesus told us to remember him and to do this as an act of remembering his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And when we come to a table, we're invited around a table to share a meal together. In those times, the most sacred thing that you could do was to sit around a table and share a meal with someone. You only shared meals with people that you loved and you respected. That was the only time you sat around the table together. But yet, we see this picture of Jesus sitting around a table with 12 guys that did not get it. 
If you look and you read the Gospels, they don't get it. Nothing clicks in their head until after Jesus has died on the cross, risen, and gone up to be with God in heaven. It's after that that kind of like ooh, light bulbs go off that, oh, this is what he was talking about when he said all these things. So they didn't even get it. They didn't know why they were sitting around this table having this meal and Jesus was talking about the end is coming and I'm going to die. They didn't get it. But not only that, he's sitting right next to him at the seat of honor is John who would later run and hide because he didn't want to be captured like Jesus was. But then to the next person is Judas. The very person that would betray him for a bag of coins and money that he would go and he would betray Jesus and says, this is the man that you want. Jesus served him. Even if Jesus hadn't even served him, the fact that Judas was invited to this table has huge proportional significance. You see, there are some churches that, that celebrate closed communion. That means if you're not a part of, of this denomination or you're not like a member, you cannot receive communion. But you see, I think that's totally against everything that Jesus did. Because if Jesus was sitting at the table with Judas, he wasn't in the group. He was the guy that should have been kicked out of the group. Why would he let Jesus literally eat from the, the food and drink from the wine that he was serving them. No, Jesus invites everyone to the table. No matter how much you've messed up, no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter what you think about yourself or what other people think about you, the only thing that matters is what Jesus thinks about you, and he thinks you're the most beautiful, gorgeous handsome, studly guy and woman that has ever walked the face of this earth and he wants you at his table because he loves you. And he doesn't care about how much you've tried to destroy his very image that is inside of you. He says, come to my table because I love you. So we take the bread because Jesus used it as a symbol of his body that would be broken. And we use the juice as Jesus used it as a symbol of his blood that would be shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, so that we could have life, eternal life, not just life here on earth, but life beyond. So as the ushers come this morning, I challenge everyone to receive communion with us today because there's not a person in this room that Jesus has not invited to this table.